welcome <coughs> Dr. Bentley and the school board, Dr. Cusick, <coughs> and all of you for, uh, for joining us here for what I hope is going to be a pro productive discussion. I would like to, uh, Brad, this is your first uh, appearance of one of these uh, free for alls. And Warren School, where's Warren? Okay. 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 So, we expect you all to be on your best behavior. Okay. My reputation okay, uh, The um, agenda it was in your iPad, and we have three topics here. And if somebody's got another topic, we can, you know, try to sneak it in at the end. But the first thing is um, <coughs> academic performance plan, and that deals with accreditation. I know Dr. Williams has some questions. The second item is on school construction, and then then finally on school finance. And, uh, so having said that, uh, I want to turn it over to my friend Dr. Houston to see if he has any comments you want to make, or you may want to turn it to Rick or however you go. Well, thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor Frame and uh, uh, council members and colleagues on the school board. Uh, we do have a presentation, as you've noted, on these three major areas of academic performance, uh, school construction plan and school finance. And um, we will entertain questions <coughs> as we move through the presentation rather than waiting to the end of the presentation on each area um, so, so that uh, we can make sure we get your questions answered on these particular areas. I am going to give it over to Dr. Bentley, who will uh, introduce staff members that will make the decisions. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Houston, um, <coughs> Mayor Frame, and city council members, uh, city manager Jones. Uh, we have staff here, our three associate superintendents, Mr. Spencer, our associate for academic, or for, I must make you academics, for uh, operations and administration, Dr. Harris for academics, and Mr. Maniscalco for uh, school finance. So we're going to have, uh, hopefully, an, uh, a good conversation today about three important areas that are important to our work in public schools. Board members have a copy of this presentation. It's been emailed to them, so we'll jump right in. The, uh, let's see if this thing works, academic <coughs> performance plan. I want to talk with you a little bit about the accreditation piece and make sure that uh, the room understands that there are some elements that are accreditation. We're talking specifically about state accreditation. This doesn't have anything to do with the federal law, No Child Left Behind, or AYP. And uh, the recent research on that is showing that that's in the process of modification. We know that the state model is going to be here for a while, so let's focus on that. And that's where our that's where our money is and that's where our work is. In the accreditation uh, orientation, there are essentially five levels. There's full accreditation for our schools. There's a provisionally accreditation, which is a new, a new element of accreditation, and that has to do with high schools only. There's accredited with warning. There's conditionally accredited. And then there's accreditation denied. What's interesting about our accreditation system is that instead of going from the bottom up, it says the top, and then you work your way down, which is an interesting thing for the state of Virginia, but that's what it is. And it's based on two big factors. One is annual testings, and this is done through the SOL testing that we have here in Virginia. And those are in our major content areas, so reading, math, science, and social studies. Other areas that kids have in school, arts, band, <clears throat> physical education, uh, some other areas like that are not part of this testing protocol. AP testing is not part of this protocol. This is the state model. The other part that is new now is our graduation rate. And as we talked about or as we presented information earlier uh, across the city, we had 10 schools that didn't make accreditation. Of those 10, four of those were high schools. And of those four high schools, the reason they didn't make accreditation was because of their graduation rate. If we just took their SOL scores and looked at those, the SO, they, each of the five high schools made full accreditation minus that uh, graduation rate, which was a new piece. And I want to talk briefly about that because I think there's some information that we need to have a better understanding about. In previous years in our world, when kids were not successful in school, the practice was to essentially <coughs> expel them. And in fact, there's been a large amount of research that's been done on this, and the comment that will often be used by people that research this, that do the literature, is called push-out. And there's an element that happens within the school. Kids get, they feel like they're being pushed out because they're not being successful in school. There's a strong correlation to academic performance and kids that drop out. 
So what's happened now with the new state law, and it got into place in about 2009, is the state of Virginia said, we can't afford to have kids drop out. <laughs> it is an economic problem for our state. It's an economic problem for our city. And what we're going to do is we're going to do everything possible to ensure that when kids start high schools, that we embrace them. We don't push them away. So this completion rate, what happens, this, the short story of it is, and it's rather complex, but the short story is any time a child <coughs> enrolls in our school in the ninth grade, that child is ours. We own that child. We have to do everything possible with that child to ensure that they complete high school within four years. <coughs> And they're measuring that, and that's a good thing. The dilemma is if that child leaves and we don't have adequate or uh, reflective data to show that that child's re-enrolled in a school, we still own that child. And there's some coding things that happen within schools. So Maury, which missed it by 80, they were 84% graduation rate. There were a few kids that either were miscoded, and we've gone back and looked, and we're we're not 100% sure, but we think there's some coding errors that we have in this. The bigger part is that sense of we own every child that comes to the door starting in ninth grade. We cannot throw them out on the street because that child then becomes part of our dropout. If that child leaves and goes to a private school and we don't have a request for records from that school, that child can become a dropout. If that child passes away, and unfortunately in our world that happens from time to time, and we don't have evidence to show what has happened to that child, that child becomes a dropout. Our schools now, because of this new law, are really carefully watching this, and I know each of our five high schools know exactly how many kids they're missing from the current cohort. So the cohort follows that child up. Child enters in ninth grade, they're with us all the way through until 12th grade. And if they don't graduate, they're, com they're considered a non-graduate and they fall under that thing of non-completing, and that's that graduation rate. We have to own the children. Sometimes in our desire to improve, the comment I'll hear from folks around our city is, just get them out of there. Throw them out. They don't want to be there. Well, the minute we do that, that's a dropout. That becomes a child that we have failed. We've lost that child. That child becomes an, a reflection on our work. And we have a 15% rate there. We don't want to get our schools close to that margin. But that dropout completion rate is new, and it's caused four of our schools not to meet accreditation uh, this past year. Four schools. Mari was close within one point. Uh, Lake Taylor was in a couple of, within a couple of points. Granby missed it there in the 70s, and, and Booker T. Washington was in the 70s. So we have some work to do there. But it's a matter of how we do our work and how we change that. We have to be more aggressive in pursuing that. I'm sorry to go into that long explanation, but I think it's something that needs to be heard uh, as we go through this, because if we start to say, well, we'll just throw them out because they don't want to be there, that child becomes a dropout, and we, we suffer the consequences for that. Last week, uh, or maybe the week before last, Mr. Smeagol uh, shared those same thoughts, uh, or those same facts with the council. And my position then, as it is now, we don't need to be so close to the borderline. Agreed. You know, I mean, we, you know, we have to shoot for, you know, a higher standard. Um, you know, if we are close to the borderline, then it's going to be an issue. But if we can get higher standards and greater results, then these issues won't be uh, a factor. I would, I, I agree with you and concur with you completely, Mr. Riddick. In fact, that's a dilemma when we start to say, let's set targets for performance. And I talk to somebody and they say, well, our target's 75% in terms of an SOL, that's not high enough. And in the Norfolk Public Schools, we've set a target of 90%. And we call that, a, it has a name, it's called Blue Summit. And we have one campus, Larchmont Elementary, that has achieved that Blue Summit Zone status in our schools. So we know that we can do that, and we know that we can get there. But you're exactly right. If we say our target is 85%, we're going to fall short. If we say our target is 95%, let's shoot for the moon. How about 100%? Well, people get nervous about that. Why should I set 100%? Oh my gosh, what if I fail? Well, you're going to get a higher than just setting the target at 85%. I agree with you completely. Until... Can I ask a, um, 
if, if a child transfers in in the 10th grade, is he part of your cohort? They are. They do become part of our cohort, uh, Mayor Frank. When you, whether it's the 9th grade or the 10th or the 11th. They whatever become they, whatever they're when they transfer in whatever they get whatever grade they get coded as they become part of that cohort. But if they're in Virginia, they have an STI number that follows them, so that will they stay in that cohort from whatever school. If they come from out of state, um, we, 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 we place them. Identify the graduation graduation grade as a as a predictor of you know, accreditation. And what are we What are we going to do? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, Dr. Mr. Yeah, Frank. One, so. one quick question. Is, as, we, as this becomes a standard, the, the graduation, one-time graduation, are we lowering standards to move them along and let them out so that, that their people no, are coming out not prepared? How, how do, not just us, but anybody that's governed by you got to get them out four years, they got to graduate. How are we sure that... And I say not just Norfolk, but any public, all the state. How are we sure that we're not turning out lower quality on the low end? So right. In other words, just the minimum standards. Right. Just right. You know, okay, close enough. You graduate. Right. Um, I think more. that's a dilemma that all schools struggle with in the we're state not of Virginia. Opening ourselves up to that in some way, or not. I mean, we, we got we control that. Uh, we do in terms of our graduation requirements. Mr. Wynn, and so the state, uh, the state of Virginia has graduation requirements. Uh, Norfolk Public Schools has graduation requirements. And there are several different diplomas that students can get to get that graduation requirement. Um, I know last year the grading scale changed, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, we did some things with ninth graders to see if we can improve performance with ninth graders. There's some measures and some practices that we had in place that were <coughs> modified because they were not helping kids get to a higher level of performance. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But in terms of that graduation rate, that is a lever that some districts will change and modify. We're not proposing to do that at this point or any other point. It seems to me we'd rather have 75% prepared kids go out of school than 85 in which 10% of them are just pushing through somehow. Right, that becomes a, that... Becomes a, um, diploma or graduation factory, right. if I may use that term. And I think that's not something we want to have happen. Obviously, it's not something that I right. seems like the state's opening up the potential for that. Maybe I'm reading wrong. Well, and that's, that's a, anytime you use uh, quantifiable measures for social change, there's an opportunity for that. Uh, Dr. Harris, are you aware of any schools in our area that have made modifications like that over the past few years? Good afternoon. Several states have added requirements to their graduation, but the majority of the states, uh, the cities in Virginia, we follow the Virginia requirements for graduation. Several have added mandatory CTE components or mandatory um, additional foreign language requirements. But for the majority of the cities, they follow the state requirements. Right. For graduation. Angela, did you? Barkley hit my question because my mom was school teacher. A lot of times, <coughs> in years and years and years ago, they just passed kids along, and so that was one of the you issues that I was going to... You can't do it because uh, a guidance counselor cannot legally certify a transcript if it doesn't meet the state requirements. And that includes passing the SOL tests that are required and meeting the minimum, you know, 22 credits. Okay. All right. So it can't be done. You can't okay. just say a kid graduated and... See you later. Yeah, yeah. see you later. Yeah. Okay. The equalizer. We'll, we'll go to Anthony. And then we'll <coughs> to Going back to this issue as it relates to... Uh, accreditation. Um, we're not the only district that this that uh, that are under these new guidelines. Absolutely. So what are other districts doing different than we are uh, <coughs> that would allow us to be uh, so far behind? Well, um, based we're, on the data. Okay, first off, we're not way behind in that respect, but we're certainly it's something we're looking at. Well, we have one of one five of five high schools. Right. Accredited. Right, and there are other school divisions in the area that, and outside of Virginia, that have similar situations. Yeah, but when I look at, again, whether it be Richmond, <coughs> uh, Portsmouth, Virginia Beach, Hampton School District, most of the smallest ones I just named the smallest school districts than we are, uh, I'm asking the question, what are we not doing? Well, part of it is our mindset in terms of being aggressive about <coughs> checking kids and following up on them finding out when they leave us. If we just summarily dismiss them and we don't follow up and find out where they went, 
then that becomes an error where that child becomes a uh, dropout. We have to have uh, concrete evidence that shows that that child's either enrolled or moved to another state or something like that. If we don't follow up on that, Mr. Burfoot, then we end up with a dropout on our roll. Have, have we gotten our arms around the, the issue today? Yes, sir. Each of the schools know specifically how many students are working with. We're doing a better job, I believe, in terms of identifying ninth graders coming in. I have a team of folks that we're working on with achievable results, and one of those things has to do with on-time graduation. And a piece of that is um, coding, and it has to do with attendance and understanding what, what, as a child enters the ninth grade, what we have to do differently well, to ensure that that child graduates within four years. I, I, can, I can tell you, most parents uh, or families that, that move into this area, uh, I think at the end of the day, the question they're asking is, and it goes back to what Mr. Reddick said, we, we can't be too close, we can't play so close to that line. Indeed. Reason being, when again, when families make the, the, the decision whether they're going to move in the city of Norfolk or in this area as a whole, the question they want to know, is that school accredited? Mm -hmm. So when we have one school accredited out of five high schools, that's concerning to me. Likewise. Yeah. You know, not that they're provisionally uh, uh, accredited, but the mere fact that they're not accredited, mm -hmm. you know, that's a that's a major concern. Well, Likewise. Uh, Anthony, and real quick, if you look at the data that went to <coughs> Winter sent us, um, the dropout rate in Portsmouth was 13.6. The dropout rate in Richmond was 14.5, and we were 15.5. So you're talking about one or two percent, which could be a handful it, of kids. It does not matter. Right. To but me. hold on, Anthony. Let me finish. We shouldn't be treading that far behind. That doesn't make me feel good, Tom. I know it doesn't, but listen, the three districts that I just gave you are the urban districts in this area. Now, you go to uh, the suburban ones, like Virginia Beach and Chesapeake, 5%, 4%. So where do you think the issue is? Is it, is, is it the schools? Is the issue the schools? We have bigger challenges here. If we know what our issues are and we're not fixing it, then there's a problem. Simply, there, you know your challenges, so you can't keep complaining about these challenges year in and year out. If they are challenges, then you fix them. But we, because they're urban schools, don't mean to me doesn't mean that we should uh, our our uh, our effort should be less, and and, and and don't think that we can meet the same beach mark, uh, beach uh, benchmarks as a Virginia Beach or a Chesapeake. And I, and I, I'll tell you that as a school board, we don't use it as an excuse. We, we own the problem. Uh, the kids in the city of Norfolk can learn. Uh, they, they can achieve. Thank you, doctor. And, uh, uh, and we don't ex embrace that as an excuse. We have some work to be done. Dr. Bender's going to share more about what we're doing in this area. And we got to get it right. We got to fix it. We got to educate our kids. We got to get these numbers up. We got to get our schools accredited. And, uh, and, and no excuse is acceptable for failing schools. And, and, uh, and, and I speak for the, for the entire school board, and I'm not saying, and I know the district agrees, and so that, that's not an excuse. We have to identify the unique challenges that may come with an urban setting and then uh, uh, find what we need to do to fix it. Well, and, and uh, with all due respect, the four students on my dropout list that I'm working on at Granby High School that are incarcerated in city jails outside of Norfolk have nothing to do with the school system. And that is an issue within our communities, and there, that is going to take some percentages. And I'm not saying that we are using that as an excuse, but it takes a, it's a lot harder for our schools to keep these kids in when you have other issues, systemic issues that you have to deal with. It's a reality. That's not an excuse. It's a reality. And that includes the community. The city council has to get involved in this and all of the community. It can't just be the schools. Now let me ask you a question, Tommy. Don't support children that you have that are incarcerated over at the city jail. The city jail has, if They're I'm not mistaken... They're not in Norfolk City Jail. They're not in Norfolk City okay, Jail. Okay, but hold on. If yeah. they are, if they were in Norfolk City Jail, the city jail has liaisons, mm -hmm. right. if I'm we not do. mistaken. Do those children still count? Yes. They yes. have an yes. IEP in, yes. in terms of us <laughs> providing education for them in yeah. the city we, jail. They right. get education but here, but these four students in particular are 18 years old. And when they're in, two of them are in Chesapeake City Jail, and they are not required to provide an education for them. Now, if those students choose as an option to go into a GED program, then we can get 75% of that on our dropout. But if they don't go into it, in this case, these students are not going into it, they are on our, our list as a dropout. And that's fine. It's accepted as a dropout. The problem is there are some things that we cannot control, 
and that we cannot get that student. We can't force that student to enroll uh, in a program there. Or how about, uh, real quickly, the girl I just found out who married a military guy and moved to Pennsylvania. <coughs> she didn't enroll in a program in Pennsylvania, so that is on our dropout list. She stays on there. You can't do anything about those things, and we're, I think that some of the schools are really working hard on getting the kids that we can get, but there's a lot of kids like that, and when you're in an area, we have a transient population, and when you're in an area like this, you have a lot of military families who move, and they don't tell us when they enroll at another school. They end up on the dropout. But this happened in other municipalities as well. This is not just Jermaine yeah. to Norfolk. Could you I just say, can, we, this, can we hear Beach. first what's going to be done? Chesapeake, and as and well as Hampton. Can we talk about what needs to be done? Can we hear about what's going to be done? I think we all are in, in agreement that we need to do It's something. a problem. Yeah. Let's see what we can do to fix it. So um, about a year ago, the Norfolk Public Schools City, the school board, sat down and said, we're going to develop three achievable results. It hasn't been for five years or 10 years or 20 years, less than one year, one year. And one of them focuses on on-time graduation. Mr. Burford, that's exactly what we're talking about. Mr. Riddick and other members of the city council, improving that on-time graduation. And that requires hands rolling up, sleeves rolling up, and getting down and understanding where children are, tracking them aggressively. We use a model called aggressive progress monitoring. And that starts with kids in pre-K all the way up. I would ask you, when you're in a school, ask a third, fourth, or a fifth grader what year they're going to graduate from high school. Because we're working on getting that set up in their head so that when they know, I'm going to graduate. In fact, the class, uh, the fourth graders are the class of 2020. And I can see high school principals all across the country and val future valedictorians planning their speeches about the class with clear vision. We're working to improve our on-time graduation and we're setting systems up in place, some that are already in place, and we're tweaking and improving those systems, like understanding where each child is, because you have to take it one child at a, at a time. <coughs> Our second one is working towards full state accreditation. We fell short. We have some problems in some schools. Many of these schools are in school improvement, which requires we have some additional funding. We get a lot of support from the Virginia Department of Education. Uh, through these schools, on time or uh, full accreditation is our second one, and the third one is about engaging with our community to get the support we need. For instance, I was talking to somebody recently, and they were talking about behavior in the cafeteria, and the comment came up: "Well, we need to get more cameras. We need to get this. Why don't we get a group of moms?" I mean, it sounds like a simple solution, and sometimes simple solutions can be really effective. But if you get a group of parents that'll come in and say, "We're going to help you do this. This is a community-wide thing." Let's get a group of parents to help us with that. So engaging, beginning at the elementary level, pre-K, when kids enter our schools, it's not enough just to say, here's my child, see you later. It's, here's my child, what can I do? And on the school side, we have to work on how do we open those doors <coughs> so that parents can be engaged. Because there are lots of parents that are fearful of schools. They look at schools and they don't have trust with the school, and we've got to work on that part. So our principals have a, they're working through a game plan with a book called Beyond the Bake Sale, which starts to say, how do we assess our systems of school improvement in terms of how we relate to parents and so on and so forth. So those are our three achievable results. Those are things that we have on our agenda. The school boards looked at that. They voted on these a year ago. They did some minor tweaking to them. That's not the exact wording, but that's the gist of it. And that's the three things that we have on our, the three big rocks or the big stones that we're working on as we go forward into the next year and year after that. Did on-time graduation rates just become a priority because of the accreditation issue? Ms. Williams? It seems like on-time graduation should have been something that was a priority forever. <clears throat> I, I hear you. I've been here 14 months. So I can say, you know, I don't know what the specifics were before we got here. We know that that was something that high schools were working on. The state of Virginia changed its laws about 2009 and said, we need to be more aggressive about this. And I can tell you there's all kinds of different statistics and ways to slice that pie in terms of how dropouts are looked and calculated. We have a system now that we're putting into place that will improve that. And part of it requires folks like our assistant principals and our attendance folks <coughs> at the schools, at the high schools, looking at that very carefully and aggressively, and then going back into middle schools and elementary. Thanks for the question. Um, we have a system of support. First one is our Virginia Early Warning System. This is a statewide system, and it's a database.
And essentially what it does is it helps us predict performance of children in starting in grade nine. Our IT people and the, the, the people that do all this wizardry with databases and things like that, John Al Aloisi is the gentleman in our division, and I see Karen Bailey back over there. John works with Karen, and, and he's in Karen's shop. John has developed this thing so that now we can actually track kids starting in sixth grade. We have our own <coughs> Norfolk Public Schools early warning system starting with kids in sixth grade. So now we can start to predict things like reading rate, their attendance, their discipline, their engagement in class, things like that. You can do that with the computers, but you don't need you, you can't get the computers working across the district in the classroom. That's certainly a dilemma. Uh, finally, then, our aggressive attendance focus on attendance and getting kids into schools, making sure they attend on a regular basis. We know, we know, we know that if a child's not present in school, they're not learning what they need to learn in school. They may be learning other things, but we know they're not learning what they need to learn in school. So we've got within those, those uh, three uh, achievable results, we have seven domains that focus on things like attendance and discipline, and we're building systems to improve that, and part of it has to do with this early warning system. Uh, the sec last thing is we're evaluating uh, new initiatives. I mentioned the uh, new grading scale, the new grading system for grade, grade nine. And Dr. Harris, would you please speak to that, the grade nine grading system? Certainly. We met with teachers and with um, principals to adjust uh, the so English the grading system. scale. Typically, children are graded by semester, so they get one grade in January, one grade in June. Uh, if they fail the first semester, they have to repeat the course the next year. English is the only high school course that children have to take for four years. They have to take it all the way up to English 12. So the dilemma is if they fail the first semester, they have to repeat it, and they're automatically behind their peers. Uh, working with teachers, they actually brought the idea to us to look at <coughs> traditional elementary grading where they're graded quarterly. And so children who struggle the first quarter would have the opportunity throughout the year to improve in their skills for English in grade nine to be successful at the end of the year. We did a pilot year one, year two, we implemented it to all our high schools and met with a lot of success for our children. They were actually uh, improving in their learning with English, and so our teachers have come back to ask us if we look at the K-12 system of grading and see what adjustments we can make. This was a grassroots effort. Um, the teachers saw the problem where children would catch on to the English, uh, the writing components mid-year, but they realized that they were already failing and too far behind to catch up. So this was an opportunity for our children to meet with success and not be behind their peers. And what happens with youngsters is they get, if they get a poor grade the first nine weeks, they get discouraged and many of them give up. And so this model that's been put into place will allow them to catch up and stay, hopefully catch up and get ahead of where they are rather than getting discouraged and giving up and saying I'm done and I, I can't I can't recover. It does yeah. allow them to catch up. So when they go to the next module they're still not behind. That's the game plan. That's the plan. So there's learning that's happening. Uh, if you do it independently kids that fail the first semester have to retake the first semester. What we're doing is called uh, grade averaging over a, a year which is essentially what we do with elementary grades. Um, moving on from there, uh, again, new promotion standards aligned with the state. We talked a little bit about that. Our promotion standards and graduation requirements are aligned with the state of Virginia. We have some specific actions that we've taken across the district. First one is focusing on data. We focus on data. We look at our student performance. We have systems in place. We have this wonderful thing called the Ultimate Data Warehouse, which captures all these performance data. The board gets a report periodically. Uh, about every uh, four to nine weeks within that to start to say, here's how many students are being successful, here's how many are not being successful uh, in terms of their four core content area subjects, English, English, math, science, and social studies. And so we have a strong focus on data and understanding from that data what's happening with children's performance. We have increased our oversight in the schools. Uh, executive directors that work with our Schools directly, I work with them directly. We're doing uh, increased oversight in terms of walkthroughs, and that's a process where principals and assistant principals get out of their office, and they go into classrooms, and they watch teachers teach. Last year, I challenged our principals to do 144 walkthroughs. 73% got 144 or more. 
That's amazing. Of our assistant principals, 58% got 144 or more. Most districts say three to 10. So our principals and assistant principals are getting very skilled in terms of watching teachers teach, coaching them, giving them feedback on their performance. That has to do with that increased oversight. I, my, our level of increased oversight at the central office is as well. So as a superintendent, I go and I have a three hour uh, campus visit. I go into classrooms, I work with teachers, I talk with the principal, I talk with the assistant principal, and I work with our executive director. So we're, see, we're moving that oversight so it becomes systemic. We're focusing on improving and delivering professional development that focuses on best practices. Mr. Burford, what works? What's working? and what's not working. For instance, we know that at Norview High School, they have a program called Capturing Kids Carts. And that's something <coughs> that we're saying, that's probably something we need to start looking at across the district. Is that something that we want to implement across the district at each of our high schools? Does it have potential? We're seeing some success there. Reading strategies, we're focusing on literacy. What are our reading strategies from K through 12 so that children are reading on grade level? We know that that's a problem and we're doing some intense focus on reading strategies with our principals. Principals become experts in those kinds of things along with teachers in the classroom. <clears throat> Conducting family workshops. We just recently had our parent, um, what is the name of that, Dr. Harris? Parent, parent Academy? Parent University. parent University. So Parent University is something that's unique to Norfolk. It doesn't exist in many places. In fact, it's unusual to find something like that. So we had a great turnout. We did it at Booker T. Washington this past year. Continue to do those workshops. Campuses are doing it as a campus initiative within their schools for a variety of different reasons. Aligning our resources so that we get, uh, so that we improve, and that has to do with our achievable results. When we get into the budget discussion, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we are focusing on our dropout prevention and on improving our on-time graduation. That's a significant effort. It's part of our achievable results, and we have systems, we're putting systems in place to improve that. And so we, that being said, we'll continue with that particular piece. Within the central administration, we did an exercise. Dr. Harris completed this recently. It's called Stop, Start, and Continue. And each of the folks that are in academics sat down and said, what do we, what do we need to start? What do we need <coughs> to stop doing? And what happens in school systems, just like in other venues, we do things sometimes because we just feel like we need to continue doing them. You start looking at them uh, intentionally and you look at them systematically and you start to be critical about them. There's things that you can stop. So they've taken things off the table in terms of things that were not producing desired results. Continuing those things that we're going to continue doing in terms of uh, aggressively pursuing kids, in terms of their graduation rates and their reading rates and math rates pre-K through 12 so that we can improve the on-time graduation. We look at the VIEWS high school data to help principals in understanding that kids that are at risk, that VIEWS thing that I talked about in our Norfolk Public Schools tool that we have now, we can clearly identify when children are at risk and then take specific action at the school. This involves a counselor, it involves a parent, it involves teachers, it involves some very serious detailed work with kids that are not being successful. We know when kids aren't being successful, we have systems in place at our elementary, middle, and high schools to improve that. Um, increased oversight through observations, I talked about that already. Uh, our professional development for teachers and principals. Uh, restructuring our monthly principals meetings. What we were doing is we had principal kind of cluster meetings and principals were not all getting together at one time. What we started this year is we have a monthly get together and it's not designed as a information dump, it's a teaching and learning networking opportunity for principals. That focuses, our focus this first uh, few meetings, and we'll continue through this, is on literacy. What are practices that are in place that we can do in terms of improving literacy from the principal's perspectives? I, I want to see our principals become experts in instruction and experts in their classrooms and experts in what t teachers are doing so they can coach teachers to a higher level of performance. Sometimes we have older systems that we don't, that aren't in place anymore because we're, we've learned them a long time ago. So what we're doing is we're teaching our principals on ways to improve that in the classroom, and they're doing it collaboratively with the central office. So we have a meeting Thursday morning here in Norfolk, and I invite you to join us if you're willing. 
Uh, it'll be at the Marriott Hotel. Our last meeting was at WHRO. We're moving our meetings around to different locations so that our principals will see these locations. But it's a very collaborative. And the word is networking, learning, opportunity. And that's important for our principals. Uh, conducting central office data meetings so that we can ensure that we're tracking that data and watching student performance. <coughs> and then finding, uh, aligning our resources to support the, to improve the dropout and on-time graduation. That's essentially the game plan in terms of what we're doing, focusing on three achievable results, seven domains, creating systems so that we can track student performance and progress, and then be aggressive about it uh, in terms of working with individual students. Working with students on an individual basis is where we need to be rather than large groups. What's a child need? Uh, uh, you may have heard me say that teaching is harder than rocket science. Teaching is harder than rocket science. The variables are constantly changing in a classroom. So you have a classroom of 25 kids and what worked with teacher uh, with a child one day will not work the next day. And so teachers, if you talk to them, that's why they're tired. Because they're constantly trying to say, how do I reach this child? Something I was doing today isn't working today. Or something I was doing yesterday isn't working today. What can I do tomorrow to ensure that that child re is engaged and participating in my class? That's the portion of the presentation that deals with school accreditation and school improvement and school, the uh, first part of the agenda. Additional questions? Not, not about that, but uh, I would like uh, for us to save enough time to talk about pepper spray and uh, some other issues, such as how our schools look, our campuses, <coughs> and lights on baseball fields. Things. So I want to save some time. For some but pepper spraying being the most important thing. So we just make sure, you know, that we have enough time for that. Well, I'd like to interject that I think that pepper spray is not nearly as important as our accredited schools. Dr. Wimber, if you put a child's eyes out, the Lord only gives you one set of eyes, one set of eyes. Well, so now, Mr. So Reddick, we have formulated that, that pepper you spray might sound, that's putting you know, the child's eyes out. Let me say this to you, Dr. Wimber. You know, you and I, you know, very cordial and we kind of get along. <laughs> but when Except it comes, for that chicken thing. Yeah, but when it comes to protecting a youngster's eyes, one thing I tell my children, have told my children, tell my young son and tell my grandchildren, the Lord is going to gonna give you one set of eyes, one set of eyes, brother. And, you know, when it comes to eyesight, the financial responsibility that we might encounter as a city, and as a school district, it's important. It's just as, if not more important, than making sure that a child graduates on time because what you're going to create is a child that's handicapped, dependent upon the state or the federal government to be taken care of for the rest of their lives if they don't have a successful suit with the city. So We're going to talk I just want to talk about it. Yeah, I'd like to know what the protocol is, too, about when the just separate so straight things. But, um, we're going to move on from the first part of the right. question, unless there's another question. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me go right here, and then we'll come up again. You know, I, I appreciate your concern about the cohorts that are not graduating and a percentage difference one way or the other. I understand. I will say that this is not new news. We knew back when I was on the school board that uh, graduation rates were um, going to be used for accreditation. And there were systems put in place at that point. And we are being compared to schools with similar um, uh, difficulties, urban cities, and we're not doing this well. But my bigger concern is our accreditation rate of the other schools and the academics. And my bigger concern is if you really look at the, sco the scores in the schools that have passed, even those that have passed, their rates are going down. Their scores are going down. <coughs> and I, the next accredited rating in those schools that you all looked at, ours was at 73%. The next one is Richmond is 84%. That's not a few percentage points. And I just want to know, what do you think went wrong? I don't know what went wrong. I think we want to say um, there were some things what that... Didn't work? What didn't work? That's a great question. What didn't work was we were fractured. We weren't doing things in a cohesive whole. 
in terms of focusing on that performance. When you bring principles together and start to say as principles, what can we do to perform? Dr. Wibley, I, I have a firm belief that if we're going to make our schools better, we're going to do it through our principals and their leadership. And I think this is borne out in research time and time and time again. When principals don't work collaboratively together, they don't start working together as a team, we don't get that sense of cohesion. And that's been part of the problem, working towards that sense of cohesion. Uh, I'd like, to, Dr. Houston, you work on one of the AR teams. Perhaps you can enlighten the members of the city council from your perspective as a board member, what that looks like. Well, let me, let me say one, one other thing first. I, I, I think, Dr. Wibbley, the question you're asking is the right question. I made a comment uh, recently in, in, in one of our conferences that I'm, I'm not sure that we have a properly diagnosed the problem. And to misdiagnose is to mistreat. I mean, I don't know. It's your discipline, not mine. And, and, and I think we have to work hard, continue to work hard. And I know it's, it's, it's a <clears throat> complex issue, but, but we really have to continue to work together to really diagnose specifically what's not working so, so that we can make sure that we are putting our, our weight and energy in, in the right places. Uh, Dr. Bentley mentioned uh, I'm, I'm, all, well, all of the school board members are assigned to what's called one of the domain teams. We have the three achievable results, seven domains, uh, areas that we are focusing on uh, that we believe will help us to achieve the achievable results. And, uh, and we're looking at them from every angle. The, the, the particular area that I'm working with is, is an area of discipline. Uh, we're, we're, we're greatly concerned with the number of kids we suspend. If, if, if a kid is, is not in school, obviously he or she can't learn, Thanks. can't perform. And, and so um, um, I've divided it into three major areas, looking at prevention, intervention, and correction. How do we improve student behavior to prevent some of this behavior, as well as adult behavior, that, that can mitigate uh, some of these incidents and keep them from escalating to the level that now requires suspension. And then, and then intervention. What can we do uh, to keep from suspending so many kids? Our long-term suspensions with special conditions is not as high, but those short-term suspensions, if you're talking 5, 10, 15 days and you get, you know, thousands of them, it's obviously disrupting the learning process of the, of the child and then they're going to be more likely uh, not to um, uh, uh, do as well in school. Um, and, uh, and so we're, we're looking at our, uh, planning to look at our level systems. Those uh, incidents that require right now, just based on our policy and practice suspension, we're looking at those <coughs> and saying, do we need to suspend kids for these particular uh, um, infractions? And then correction. If we just suspend a kid for five days, but we don't address the problem, then uh, 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 we're not. We're going to continue to have a low graduation rate, or not meet the the, the, the graduation rate that we desire. And so we, we have to look at how do we provide support and services to help correct the behavior. Now that's just an area of discipline, but there and there are other areas as well. You know, student engagement, staff engagement. But of course, um, uh, we t talked about attendance. And, and so we're having to look at it from 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 every from, from every angle. And that that's just one example, the discipline area that that I'm working specifically. With. Gotcha. Go ahead, Ann. Okay. Uh, well, I heard Dr. Bentley say it, it, it's uh, my issue is this. Well, Dr. Bentley just said that you know sometimes we you know filters down and work with principals and I don't accept that premise. I mean, you know, usually when a, when a district we were doing well and we were charting who would we who would we give the accolades to, it would be the superintendent for doing a good job. It wouldn't filter down to the principals. Uh, we would say the administration did a good job within our school district. Uh, and I feel the same way if we're not doing well. It should start at the top. Uh, I think we got some, some dedicated teachers, principals in our school district. Uh, I take something as simple as whether or not we're giving the teachers the support they, they so deserve. Uh, I've taught the teachers uh, at the elementary level, the middle school level, at the high school level <coughs> within my district. And I go back to this issue as it relates to an IT issue. Uh, you talked about uh, technology and you talked about uh, 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 monitoring and, and uh, data, being data driven. Uh, but how can we be data driven uh, from an IT, and you alluded to an IT. Uh, uh, from, from a uh, technological standpoint, but yet we don't have computers 
that are working in the classrooms. And we talk about bridging that, that divide uh, in, from the, uh, the elementary level or early childhood programs. So we got early childhood uh, uh, centers or schools that don't have computers. We have, I mean, that don't have the computers, the system, well, the, the, the internet, it was an IT, the, from an IT standpoint, the, um, uh, what is it, the, um, uh, forget the terminology there, but the, the computers are not working, okay? At the middle school level, computers are not working in the classroom. <clears throat> These are things that we knew before school started, you know, and some are working now and some are still not working. And we're almost through the first semester of, of, of uh, our, our uh, school year. And so my question is, how can we uh, uh, say that we're fixing the problem or we're getting ahead, but yet we're not addressing those core concerns or, or, uh, from, a, from a technology standpoint, making sure that our kids <coughs> are prepared there? Mayor Frame, may I respond? Mr. Dr. Houston. Last year, we had a huge problem with this, Mr. Berkeley. It's the server, that's what it is. The server. Okay. From an we, had a, we had a ginormous, monstrous problem with this. And we put in some systems in place this spring to improve that. And I've got data to show that we have made improvements in those areas. We have put a system in place that's called Every School Every Day. We have network engineers that go into schools. One of the dilemmas that we're struggling with is we had to cut 500 positions, 500 positions over the past two years. Some of those positions were positions in that area. IT? And, yes, sir. Yes, sir, because but, they were deemed as not as essential. So but you, we're. But you made strategic cuts, understanding that <coughs> technology is very important. But okay. even, with, even, even, even with that, you had, I gotta say, even with that, you knew that if you did it in the spring, we closed the school in June. We had June, July, August, September when the school opened back up to fix the problem. Our kids, our kids should be entitled to a first-rate education. That means that we do all that we can do to ensure that. We can't talk about graduation rates if we're going to not give the kids what they need in the classroom. If, if, if it's an issue, as a, as a, if it's a financial issue, those are the things that we talk about, whether the meetings that we used to have every month or so, or what before budget uh, talks at Zoom in the, at the table. Those are issues that we should talk about. The other issue that I brought up, and it, it's, we got a lot of new board members here, and I appreciate you all for, for, for taking the challenge and being on our school board. But before you guys got here, we were talking about, I had brought up the issue from elementary school to middle school, where are these kids going? We're losing these kids. And where are they? You have so many kids at the elementary school. At the middle school, you, you, you lose a few at the elementary school. From the time they, from the eighth grade to the ninth grade, you might, you, you got a graduating class of 400, but when they go on to high school, you got 200. Where are these kids going? Now, this is an issue that's coming back to bite us because in terms of we need, we have to, we're responsible for those kids. And that's affecting our graduation rates. And so the issue, this is something that's like Dr. Whipley said, this is not new. You know, but the question is, what are we doing about it? In terms of the data that we're collecting at the elementary level, passing it on to the middle school level, and if we see, if we, we're tracking the data, and we understand the pockets where we're having problems are at, then what are we doing about to mitigate those problems? If it's a military issue, what are we doing about it? You know, if it's an issue as it retains to some of our fragile communities, then we got an offer of redevelopment and housing. We need to bring everybody to the table. But I don't buy the excuse that somehow the city of Norfolk is different from Hampton, Virginia Beach, or Chesapeake because they're graduating kids. And to me, you know, they, they don't set the bar, but we set our own bar in this city, and our bar should be a lot higher than that. But I, I, several things. Yeah, the only thing I want, want to say. In response and and, uh, and and I said earlier we have to fix the problems then I, I don't believe in resting on excuses however we can't ignore the fact that we lost 47 million dollars in the last two years now you lose 47 million dollars that 30 million dollars that was 10 percent of our operating uh, uh, budget we have to make cuts somewhere two years ago it was ITRTs. Uh, um, ITRTs. 
that was a part of, of, of those cuts. And $30 million, that cuts to the bone. And so you're going to feel that. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter where you take it from, you're going to feel it. If it's in the area of security guards, if you're talking about reducing teachers, now you're talking about student-teacher ratios going up, uh, you're talking about in the area of ITRT, now you're talking about IT issues, and then another $17.4 million last year, we don't know what it's going to look like this year. That, that affects and impacts uh, 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 the, the delivery. Of, and so we have to figure out how to do more with less. Do we keep getting these unfunded mandates, you know, from the, from the federal government? And so we, we, we have to take all of that into consideration as we continue to work hard and, and, and remain responsible and accountable for educating our children. But we didn't make that well, cut. We no, I understand that. that. I, I wanted to be understood. Oh, sure. That it that wasn't was. this body no, no. that made no. that cut. That, right. The cut came from the state. Exactly. Yeah. The state okay. was actually Yes. But, but, it, but and in, we were in losing children what, before we lost the money. I don't I don't. I mean, I think we made the point. Right? Well, Tommy, Just we a have... question um, on the academic side. Um, every study, every professional development I've ever been to, every journal says that quality ed education is when you have quality teachers. Have you seen a decline in quality teachers over the years being attracted to Norfolk Public Schools because of benefits and other things? Uh, employees in Norfolk are going on their fifth year now without a raise or cost of living adjustment. Um, are you seeing uh, the quality teaching applicants uh, lower? Uh, and for example, if there's a math opening right now, or how many math openings do we have now I don't for know teachers? Right but how many applicants are we getting for mm -hmm. math teachers? I don't know, maybe Dr. Harris. <laughs> well, we're, we're in the process of searching for a new associate superintendent for human resources. Yeah. So to answer that question, I would say yeah, I think there's certainly a relationship with that, Mr. Smeagol and, and members of the city council. Um, teachers have become much more um, um, migratory. They seek other kinds of things in their life. Pay Salary is certainly one of those top three that uh, teachers talk about. When you look at research on how teachers perceive their work, salary is in the top three. The other two, though, are that professional development that teachers get in terms of the work that they do with uh, students, and then the most important one is that sense of culture and belonging. And the data and uh, people that do this research, our own research, points that out, that sense of belonging and being a part of a team and being something bigger than we are is important. So creating those connections between schools, schools are what's called a loose coupled organization. They're disconnected. What we're doing here is bringing that sense of connection with our schools so that our principals in elementary are working with middle school, principals in middle school are working with high school in one nice big unit. In terms of dealing with the technology and things like that, those are things that we look at frequently. And I can tell you, uh, Andrea Socorro, who's our uh, individual that works senior coordinator, senior director for uh, information systems, that's something she tracks carefully in our new system that we put into place. While it's not perfect, is certainly a far better cry than what we had a year ago. And if, if, if I could just, I'll, I'll bring an end to this discussion, but I, I guess the point is, Doctor, is, and, and Kirk here, he just looked at me and smiled. He said, I thought you said we could do this in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> but um, every school system in Virginia took cuts. They all took cuts, and they were basically across the board. You know, and some took a few, you know, some could adjust to them better than, than others. Um, um, I still think on a how much we spend in this city when you combine federal sources, not a lot of federal sources, but state sources, local <coughs> sources, I still what we spend on a per child basis compares very favorably or should be at maybe, uh, you know, I don't know that anybody, any of the cities in Hampton Roads spend more than we do. I think there was when maybe Isle of Wight on a per child basis maybe spends, uh, I'm not sure, I forget who we're looking for. But, uh, so, um, funding is very important, uh, obviously, Indeed. and uh, the notion that, you know, maybe we cut it too far to the bone with these security guards and maybe some IT people. And, and you know, at a point in time, it was, the city council had to look at something there, too. But, but, you know, we just, I mean, um, um, I think what Anthony has said and what Paul has, has said and what, what Terry has said, I mean, we, I think we could have seen this coming, some of this, and we should have been uh, quicker. We should have been stronger. And um, there are no, and 
Kirk said, we, you know, we don't rest on excuses. We sure you don't. can't. We, we are where we are, and we're going to, we have to do better. And so, um, and we expect better. We'll and I can better, say, and all of us, you know, Mayor Frame speaking on behalf of the administration, from my perspective, we own the problem. We're not ignoring it. We're not making excuses. We own the problem. We have systems we're putting into place that have been put into place and some that are coming that should and we should see some improvement in these areas. Okay. I think we're going to try to do I just got one question. Uh, and that dealing with the particular incidents that we had recently with pepper spray, but if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we are the only district in the region who allows our officers to use pepper spray and it's, it was just it's just been within two days we've had two incidents or three or four days we have two incidents and so I think after the first incident of pepper spray and nothing happened that I, and then you know our, our guards might believe that it's okay to use pepper spray and <clears throat> my question to our lawyer is uh, if somebody is blinded where well, I got a call from a lady whose son just happened to be in an area so if some innocent bystander is, is blinded, do we have uh, financial exposure? You know, in my business, uh, you can't be confident even when you know the facts. Right. But hypothetically, um, uh, schools are permitted to use that sort of uh, force when necessary. So it all turn upon those sort of circumstances. Certainly, if uh, an individual um, did it in, uh, contrary to the policy and inappropriately, that there could be some circumstances that were so gross that it could be lead to liability to us. But I think that you're on to the bigger question, which is um, not the liability, but the safety of the children and, and, and their sight. Yes. Oh, I, I know, Paul, maybe we could have a, another meeting later, but, I, but um, the issues, uh, I had a, a parent say, tell me about the Blair where I mean, apparently the incident itself only involved two or three children, as far as I'm aware. I might be wrong. Somebody can correct me. But, but um, it's two girls. It was two, 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 two girls, and his son was sort of within the proximity and got some of the pepper spray. So it it just um, it, it being the, I think the council would like to know what the protocols are for the use of this. I mean, who is you know who evaluates this and and. Um, so and whether or not it's a good, I mean, at what point in time does, I mean, do you have one security guard in, in the cafeteria? If that's the case, then maybe we ought to know about that. Indeed. Maybe, maybe that's something that the, the city ought to, you know, the, the guys here who, are, uh, who answer questions in the public ought to know. So, but uh, the pepper spray, pepper spray, I'm not aware of anybody actually getting hurt or injured. I think, you know, maybe, I mean, I, I don't know if anyone was taken to the hospital. Is May I ask Mr. Spencer to comment on this, Mayor Frame and members sure. of the City Council? Michael, Michael, will you please tell us and talk to us about the pepper sprays? Well, we actually use what's called OC spray. We don't use pepper spray because it's less costly. Um, our opportunities, the occasions we use it are very rare, actually, Councilman Reddick. Uh, last year we had six incidents where we actually used OC spray. We only use it in those occasions where there's something going on that the child's going to either hurt themselves or hurt somebody around them. Uh, you index the uh, the incident at Blair uh, yesterday. I mean, we had two young ladies who were, I mean, engaged to the point where, while staff was trying to separate them, they were afraid that one of those girls was going to hurt the other, and so the officer bent down and, and sprayed her in the face after warning her uh, that it was you know going to be dispersed. Immediately she let go, and they were able to break that up. Um, you know, there was a security officer on the floor with her, got a little bit of a dose of it too. That would be, um, you know, the kind of occasion, though, that you would expect somebody to use it. Um, there were six occurrences last year. There were, I think I'm right when I tell you, 17 the year before, 13 the year before that. Given, given the number of children that we have in the school system and the kinds of activities that go on, and we are particularly dense when it comes to security staff. I mean, these are people, as uh, Vice Mayor said, I mean, these people that work really hard. Uh, that's, that's a tough assignment. Um, it, at Blair yesterday, they had uh, two, three security officers in there, a couple of administrators. But, you know, when, it, when an event like that happens and there are people around and they're trying to clear it out, trying to create a perimeter, 
don't want anybody to get hurt. I mean, that, as Councilor Riddick, you said, we don't want anybody to get hurt. That's the least uh, intrusive way that you can get in and, and uh, kind of break things up and get it where it needs to be. I don't know that it's the greatest answer in the world, but I mean, that's what we have in our our hand to use. We, we use it very judiciously. And you know, again, I, it's Mr. not the headline we want. Mr. Spencer, would you talk a little bit about the protocol when the security person makes that decision? Sure. And, and it's, you know, it's, as you might guess, it's very rapid. Things are developing pretty quickly. Uh, the protocol is, though, that you don't just generally spray. You're looking for a target. If there's one individual and you're targeting that individual, that's when you use OC spray. Uh, once it's done, uh, there's a protocol for clearing the area. We try to look out for everybody. There is, Mayor, as you suggest, um, a form that needs to be filled out. So the person that discharges it got to be very clear. This is why I did it. This is what I did. Somebody comes behind them and evaluates that process. Um, if it wasn't done in the way the policy dictated, then they're reprimanded for that. Uh, there's always retraining. We're training these people annually uh, on the use of this particular uh, device. <coughs> we, don't, we don't take this lightly at all. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't take people engaged in combat in the middle of 200 people lightly at all. Because somebody's probably going to get hurt. And I want it stopped as quickly as we can have it. It can happen. Uh, if I could just say, Mr. Spencer, I understand that, but I think also perhaps the deterrent needs to be before we get to that point of having to use spray, dealing with police and, and, and their having to use certain uh, spray or certain other uh, restrictive manner on, on the prisoners. I think in this case, Perhaps before we get to that point that it has to be used, that there may be or may need to be some examination of what are the guards doing or the individuals that are there for the safety purposes doing during the time that this particular incident may be proving. Meaning, were they in the vicinity? Did they see certain clues of the children that things might escalate to the point that it becomes a physical altercation? Did they hear voices raised as... Uh, items were brewing until it got to the point that there was actual physical combat. That may be something I would ask, just from my perspective, that you may want to look into to prevent having to do this from what I've seen with two days in a row now, or at least pretty close, at least in the same week. And it should be, and I understand that we've had the frequency of six times or 17 times, whatever it is in a year, and, and perhaps we can then make it one time in a year. Uh, so I would just say, look at what caused it, look at where the people were placed <coughs> in the room, and perhaps they can get those clues earlier than, than the actual time it happened. No, I think, Mr. Prentice, you have to look at. Your points are exactly on target. And if, if our security officers do anything well, I mean, if they have a job, number one, just like police officers on the street, they spend their time making relationships, <coughs> getting to know kids, understanding uh, groups of children within school and where those kinds of uh, issues might spring up, trying to mediate them before they get started. I mean, they do that all the Just time. Just make this part of your after but action I, review. Yeah, and I appreciate it. Well, yes, and Andy, um, 40 years ago when you were in high school, fights were a little bit different than now. You don't actually stand up and and set up like this. They usually just go for the jugular now. I so, <laughs> but most of the time, it, it's you know, administrators and everybody work very hard to prevent things from happening. And in most cases, when you talk to the children, they'll tell you, "Well, my mama told me not to deal, not to take that kind of disrespect." And they just go right up and hit the kid right in the face, and it turns into a serious altercation. And you put a teacher in the middle of that, or any any of our staff members, or another student. Uh, I've seen kids, other kids, get injured in this, and, and I've also seen cases where pepper spray being used was appropriate. Most of the time, uh, it really saved it saved other people around them from getting hurt. And yes, kids will ingest uh, sometimes, and it scares them, but it could be a lot worse. Picking up chairs and throwing they pick up desks now and throw them sometimes. 
how do you control that? How do you how do you prevent something from that happening? Other than if we find out about it, we deal with oh, it. Oh, I think that it. Well, I can tell you, you prevent it. I mean, I mean, if we're here to, to do the after action review. No, no, no. no what I think so. so thank you. This, is, this is also our agenda already. I mean, uh, Mr. Reddy brought it up. But look, we had about an hour scheduled for this discussion. We're into an hour and fifteen minutes. Maybe that wasn't realistic. But what I would like to do is give Dr. Houston the opportunity to present the construction plan and then come back I'm, I'm before the end of the year here and let, and then we'll ask questions and we'll have a discussion about it. Let's at least, and there's a third uh, item on here about funding and um, we will have to, uh, you know, we'll get to that as soon as we get together. Indeed. So incidents like those that have happened cause us to look at our policies and review those things. That's exactly what happened. So we appreciate the comments, and that is certainly something that's on our plate. Could you uh, also address for us later uh, the changes that I understand you have now in search policies? I certainly will yeah, for reviewing that as well. I think that's important, and I'd like to know some background on that. Indeed. Why that's okay. uh, school construction. You received a resolution. Well, I'm, I'm going to oh, ask Dr. Houston to do this real quickly. Okay. Right. Or is he just going to jump through it? Sure. Um, back, back in June, at the request of council, we submitted our resolution on the order of, of schools for, the, for, for construction. And, um, and, and the order that, we, uh, that, that the school board agreed upon was the uh, Broad Creek School or Richard Bowling School in Broad Creek Community, Campus Stella Oceanview and Larchmont. Uh, and, and, and of course, a part of the, the consideration for Ocean View Launchmont was was determining whether uh, uh, one could be done simply with renovation and not necessarily new construction. Now, a, a great deal of discussion, of course, uh, was held over uh, uh, the the place of Capistella on the list uh, because we, we do understand that uh, for some for the last ten years that that community has been has been promised a new school. Um, a part of the discussion has been two things. One, uh, whether or not the school would remain a uh, K-5 school or that we would uh, build a K-8 school. The other was, um, uh, given the, uh, the wetlands there, whether or not we could build the campus still at the new school with the existing school and the children still in school there. We, we, we have determined that, that um, uh, it, it, it's possible to build uh, uh, the new school with the current building there, um, but but perhaps not not in our best interest in order to build the, the kind of school we want the community to have, and that will serve us well for the next 50 years. And uh, uh, it would be much better, in our opinion, to uh, be able to uh, uh, demolish that school, relocate the children, and, and build a kind of school and make the best use of the lot there, which would mean the, the, the new school, the new Richard Bowling or Broad Creek School would be built first. The children from Richard Bowling move into the new school. The kids from Campus Stella would move into the Richard Bowling School while we build the new Campus Stella School. Um, uh, on November the 9th, uh, we will have uh, our work session and a town hall meeting there at Campus Stella to uh, give the community members there an opportunity to share uh, their thoughts uh, specifically with regards to uh, the K-8 model. We've talked uh, uh, a lot about, and we had great, great feedback and presentation from the, from the administration about the pros and cons of a K-8 school, looking at the vision for Norfolk and what would serve our uh, school district uh, best, uh, and, uh, and that is uh, looking at the one K-8 school per uh, district per, to serve each of the five high school zones or areas. <coughs> And, uh, and, and the campus Stella School could quite possibly be that Lake Taylor Community uh, uh, K-8 school. And so we've talked a lot about um, uh, the pros and cons of it. We want to hear from the community, and, uh, and we hopefully will make a decision on that in, uh, uh, in our December meeting. But, but, and, the, and the rest of the information is included in the agenda. I would prefer to take the rest of the time on this to entertain questions about it. Um, well, why don't we take the questions at the next meeting, Paul, and, and everybody on, on the construction. One thing, at, at this pace, it just, we are going to, it's going to take forever to get these schools done. <coughs> I mean, and that's, and that's what we want to, I mean, I want to advance that uh, and, uh, as, as quickly as, as possible um, within our, uh, the, you know, limitations of our budget, but still, um, we'll, we'll find a way, but if 
we just we wait till I know we're not waiting till camp until uh, crossroads is done. But if you just want to queue them up, you ought to be able to do more than one. Then in, in my you know at least uh, you ought to be moving ahead uh, on on schools at different fronts. I know the manager's eyes just got broken. <laughs> I, just, I, had, I, had an, I had an informal session, uh, informal conversation. Should I say with Dr. Houston on last night? Uh, in regards to doing a public-private, uh, and one of his concerns, as I'm sure that he will share with everybody, is the fact that he doesn't, what well, he said earlier, you know, uh, in his comments, a school that will last us 50 years. So he's concerned about planning a school uh, and not a cookie-cutter model. And I, I believe that we can make the type of school that we need to, you know, develop using the public-private and accelerating our um, um, construction process. Because as it stands now, just like you mentioned, it's going to take us forever. And so we really need to do whatever, use whatever mechanism we can use to, to give these communities, whether it's Ocean View, Large Brown, Campus Color, uh, Lindenwood, give these communities a top-notch school uh, without waiting, you know, until the next, you know, 10 or 15 years. Right. I mean, We're watching the legislation, too, for we should be watching legislation for Webb and Warner with the historical schools and making sure that we take advantage of that once it, it comes out. It looks like it has bipartisan support and um, that would be that's your public private uh, incentive. Well, Broad Creek obviously has to be a new school. Uh, Camp Estella, I don't know that that thing, I, mean, I don't think anybody would think that would be a, I won't get into all this. Hey, hey, get it. Careful. <laughs> easy, easy. Careful. Right. Then, uh, Okay. Well, why don't we, um, uh, and unless the, any member of the school board would like to make a comment, why don't we can end the discussion here and with the promise that you'll come back on a, you know, at 5 o'clock someday here soon and we can we can talk more about this school construction, maybe the public-private thing, try to get it out on the table, see if it makes sense. But, uh, and I, then we'll talk about your funding issues here too. We certainly need to... Uh, to have a joint, we need to discuss a legislative agenda for the General Assembly, which the city and, and the school system should you know, jointly you know, move forward with. And I think in the past we've had two separate agendas, and I think we ought to be working more closely together with that. So, great. So that's a right? great idea. I would just like to ask that if, when we do talk about school funding, I would like that very much aligned with exactly what we are talking about today and that is what improvements we're going to make to make these schools better, what that's going to cost, what that's going to look like. Yeah, some idea of what the school construction numbers might No, I'm not talking about construction. I'm talking, talking about, about academic performance and how we're going to get these schools to do better and what that looks like financially. Right, right. Aligning the budget goals with yeah. the academic. Right. Uh, sure. but, uh, but for us, sure. I mean, the state basically has a number of, they can build an elementary school for $22, 24000000 million on a statewide average. You know, can, can we do that? I mean, and if we can't, why can't we? And so we have at least, so the manager can at least have a number. But I want to be more aggressive with the school construction and with these. I mean, and um, we, I don't think we can just plan one, build one, and then come back and plan one, build one. We ought to be moving forward on a couple of these things at the same time so we can, you know, mm -hmm. that's the point. That's the point. Accelerate. Accelerate. I'm sorry. Okay. Hey, I just want to make a statement. I copied down or took notes on many of the questions that were asked. And I do hope we have the opportunity to talk more about the programs that we have put in place that's going to help us possibly to improve our schools. I think we need to go into the K through 8 model with everyone because there are some very positive things in implementing this model that's going to make some improvement in our system. So I, I think it's, it, we need to take the time to talk more about these programs because I promise you, each of us are sitting at the table scratching our heads looking at these scores and wondering where we should go. And we do have some definite things that we need to articulate <coughs> more in depth with this group. So we, some of these questions can be uh, answered appropriately. All right, Dr. Well, thank you. And I totally again, very much appreciate uh, 
uh, the school board uh, for coming today and, and the staff. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you. All right. We're going to eat and then we're going to come back and start talking.